All right, Jay Belsky, Terry Moffitt, welcome to the show. Great to be here. You bet. Okay, so you are both professors of human development and two of the four co-authors of a book called The Origins of You, How Childhood Shapes Later Life. And what this book is, it's a collection of insights this group of leading psychologists has gleaned from years of studies about childhood development. And Jay, you came in, you synthesized and summarized the studies for the book. And the kind of studies that you respectively done, these are called longitudinal studies. And really the highest quality of longitudinal studies where children, they're basically, they're followed from birth and followed for decades into adulthood. You had researchers coming in, checking in with the parents, doing in-depth interviews. They're doing observations. They're doing tests, all to figure out how childhood affects adult life. So let's start off with this. Tell us more about these longitudinal studies, how they work, and what they look like. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for asking. Longitudinal studies are my life's work, so I could talk about them for hours and hours, but I'll try to keep it short. The idea here is that you draw a sample of all the babies born in a certain place in a certain time. Usually, it's in one city in one year, but sometimes you do all the babies born in one country in one week, something like that. And then you start collecting data on them and assessing them and their parents and families and follow them forward through time. The particular studies that Jay has written about in the book, one of them takes place in Dunedin, New Zealand, which started with all the babies born in that city in 1972. There are about a thousand of them, and they're now in their late 40s. And the last time we saw them was April 2019, luckily before the pandemic, when you could still collect data. And at that point, 94% of those original babies still took part in the project. So, that's really important scientifically because it means that the people who had, you know, poor health or mental health problems or inadequate social development have not dropped out along the way. The studies still represent the population. The other ones, one of them was the NICHD, National Institute of Child Health and Development Child Care Study, And that was a longitudinal study of children at the beginning of life with the major focus on recording all of the time that they spent in childcare and measuring the quality of that childcare to see how that major influence on their life panned out. And those children have now been followed. How long, Jay? How old are they? Our funding was cut off at age 15, so we followed them intensively from birth to age 15. Okay. And so, what Jay just mentioned is that all of the success of this kind of endeavor does really depend a lot on funding because nobody ever makes a commitment to fund a study for five decades. (laughs) And you have to, the research team has to go along continuously writing new proposals and putting forward new ideas and making a justification for collecting more information at the next stage of life. So, when, when the Dunedin study started, It was really a study of of things like early development, walking, talking, crawling, baby teeth, that kind of thing. And now we're having to make the case for studying things like menopause and heart attacks. So you have to keep on your toes to keep pitching the research project to funding agencies as you go along. Well, let's talk about some of the insights that you all have gotten from this research. Because I know a lot of our listeners, they're either their parents and they're probably like a lot of parents in modern life, they're paranoid. Like, what am I, am I, am I doing things that are messing up my kid for the rest of their life? <laughs> or there's their teachers or their coaches or their mentors. And so maybe get some insights on things they can do. And then also maybe like stuff that's out of their control. So let's talk about the first thing you talk about in the book is this idea of temperament, right? So you looked at kids and you basically kids at a young age, they're either really like shy and reserved or they're like hyperactive, super risk-taking, or they're just sort of somewhere in between. And I think a lot of parents are wondering, well, is my shy kid always going to be a shy kid? Or is this kid who's just like making a mess of things and like starts fires in the backyard? Is he always going to be like that? Is that going to have, is that going to haunt him in adulthood? So what does the research say about childhood temperament and its influence on adult life? Jay, would you like me to speak first and then hand over to you? Go for it, Timmy. 
Okay. Uh, I think the, the question here is, you know, if my child is a very shy child, will they always be shy for the rest of their lives? Or if they are an aggressive child who hurts others, will they all, always be in trouble th- for the rest of their lives? What our research with these longitudinal studies has shown, absolutely yes and absolutely no. <laughs> so, <laughs> like many things with human beings, it's quite difficult to have a, a simple answer. Life is just too complex. And that's one of the things that Jay really draws out in the book. Now, I have to say that one-on-one, when a, when a researcher does a, a project in a longitudinal study and finds some continuity from early childhood temperament to midlife, and let's say we have found things that children who were very shy at the age of three actually get married later than children who were more outgoing. So, it takes them longer to find a partner. But when they do find a partner, they're less likely to get divorced. So, they stick with that partner once they find them. Now, that's not shyness. That's marital stability. But you can see when you start to think about it that it might have its roots in shyness, that children who are quite careful around strangers when they're very young and a little bit timid and who sort of wait and watch to see how things are going to go do turn out to then later be the kinds of adults who are careful with their relationships. So, it's you wouldn't say it's shyness that is carried along, but it's more this kind of careful approach to relationships. And developmental psychologists call that heterotypic continuity, which is kind of a big phrase, but what it actually means is that the relationship between childhood and adulthood doesn't need to be absolutely one-to-one, shy-to-shy or aggressive-to-aggressive, but you can see the, in the adult behavior, you can see the roots of the childhood temperament. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. I mean, you want to talk about the other end of the distribution, the, you know, out of control acting out kids early on and their legacies? Yes, yes. So, one, some of the research that we've done, in particular in the Dunedin study and also now in the Iris study in, in Britain, the two longitudinal studies we have, is following children who were very aggressive and to see how they turn out in adult life. And here's what happens. You have a lot of children who are sort of out of control when they are little, and they have little boys who have difficulty adjusting to first grade. That kind of thing is absolutely normal. But what we're looking at is when a child is aggressive and badly behaved across situations at home, at school, in the neighborhood, according to their preschool teacher, their first grade teacher, second grade teacher, third grade teacher, fourth grade teacher, their mother when interviewed repeatedly, their friends. Everyone agrees that this child is um, aggressive and badly behaved, and they sustain it over many years of childhood. That kind of a beginning has turned out to be bad news for adulthood. So, those young people tend to go through adolescence, getting involved in juvenile delinquency. Adolescence is a time when a lot of kids break the law. That's perfectly normal. But these kids who started out aggression when they were two or three years old and and continued it right through primary school, according to all reporters, end up being the more physically aggressive. They're comfortable with solving social problems using violence. And then when they get into adulthood, they've burnt a lot of bridges. Uh, They don't have friends. They've probably dropped out of school. So, they don't have many alternatives to crime. And they tend to have also damaged the relationships with their family. So, they find themselves in young adulthood sort of at wit's end, and an antisocial lifestyle seems appealing to them. And it continues on. And then in their 30s and 40s, it becomes worse and it spreads into all areas of life. And they commit crimes at work, embezzle money, show up at work intoxicated. They get involved in domestic violence with their partners. And so, they they really have a lot of very bad outcomes. I have to caution though and say, this is a very small group of mainly males. So, we're talking about under 5% of little boys who would take this pathway. And let me just build on what Temi said here, because I was intrigued that Temi was talking about preschool and second grade and third grade and fourth grade and described it as early. From the standpoint of the entire life, it is early. But we have to appreciate is that 
when the Dunedin people study first started characterizing both these timid, inhibited, and these, you know, would-be antisocial children, it was at three years of age. So it really is what Temi's describing, just to amplify somewhat, early and continuous development along the same track that becomes the forecast for similar functioning in the future. So that child who is very timid as a three-year-old, but gets encouraged to be a little more exploratory and risk-taking and social by the time they're starting school in second grade and third grade, can grow out of it. And by the same token, many of those children, or at least some of them, who start out with those difficult personalities or difficult temperaments, if they get support and encouragement and consistent discipline that's not too harsh um, and is proportionate to the, quote, childhood misdeeds they commit, they can grow out of it too. So we have to see the child's continuing development within the context that he he or she is growing up. Sadly, many of those timid children are encouraged to maintain their timidity, if you would. And many of those problematic children at three and four don't get the kind of input that might re-regulate their development. Right. So I think an interesting point you made is the development of temperament. There's a, like a multi-process going on, and one of them is like the reactive process, right? When a, a child acts out or acts timid, like the adults around them respond to that. And that response like actually exacerbates or could exacerbate the timidity or the aggressiveness. That's exactly right. That's what one of the authors, Afshalom Kaspi, nicely wrote about, you know, in this book and elsewhere, which is called an evocative effect. But there's also an appreciation that the child is a producer of its own development. So, you know, the the aggressive child might seek out other children who are aggressive or maybe victims, and in then and in that sense, keep producing the same behavior. So it's both the feedback you get from the world. And the world you create for yourself that become forces that either maintain who you are or alternatively, if you're doing opposite things, can change who you are. So it sounds like most kids, like their temperament is somewhere in the middle between extreme timidity and extreme aggressiveness. And the outliers, those are outliers. And for the outliers, there's possible to intervene, but does it sound like it has to be kind of, it has to be relatively early for there to be a good chance of having an effect? Oh, you know, there has been a real push in the last 10 years towards early years interventions. And I think it's important to keep those in in the context of that before that, the alternative was that you didn't really intervene with an aggressive child until they broke the law, got, uh, you know, got identified by the police, press charges and, and go to jail. And obviously that was years too late. Or you didn't really intervene with the child who was failing to learn to read until they were around fourth grade and having difficulty making that transition to junior high school. And we know that's, we now know that's way too late. So there's been a, there's always swings and roundabouts in behavioral science. And in the past 10 years, there's been a swing toward, we must intervene earlier. That's absolutely true. Nobody would disagree with it. But that's not the same thing as saying, and it's hopeless if you intervene late. There is a kind of a snowball effect that if a child is having difficulties in very early life and we don't intervene, then those difficulties can bring on more difficulties. Let's take a child who has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and they're very, very overactive and sort of under controlled. And because of that, they lose friends. And so while we're taking a wait and see attitude to see whether, you know, how this was going to go, in the meantime, they've lost a lot of friends and they've lost a lot of time on their educational building blocks as well. So if we wait until they're, say, 10 or 11 years old to start considering whether to treat their ADHD, there may be some bridges burned for that child. Whereas if we had done earlier intervention, the child might have ended up with better reading and more friends at school and been happier at school. So undeniably, early intervention can prevent this kind of snowball effect where one simple small problem grows into several very big problems and becomes harder and harder to change. 
But we've also shown incidents where in our longitudinal studies where if young people who had poor self-control made it through high school without getting addicted to anything and without getting pregnant and without dropping out of high school, that their lives can be turned around. So that's suggesting that age 17, 18 is not too late. It just, it all depends upon the kinds of interventions that you want to attempt and whether they're naturalistic ones or ones that are imposed. Well, you mentioned self-control. That was another thing you looked at. And I think by now, a lot of people have heard about the marshmallow test, right? That Mm -hmm. you do this test on this guy. I forgot who it was. You know, did the test, uh, the kids put in a room with a marshmallow. If they were able to like control themselves and not eat the marshmallow, they get like three marshmallows. And so now parents like, well, I got to teach my kid self-control. And because that'll help them because then they followed them and said, well, if you have self-control as a kid, you'll have more self-control as an adult. Is that what your longitudinal studies found as well? Definitely so. I'm a big fan of the marshmallow test. I think it's it's so much fun. And I know a lot of, of uh, parents now are sort of trying it out on their children when they're around two or three years old. They spring them on cookies or marshmallows and see what they do. We need to keep in mind that that test was only ever one sample of one behavior on one day. And it's well known that Every child has a bad day now and then or just isn't feeling well or is a bit cranky. There's a lot of reasons why a child might fail the marshmallow test on one day and it doesn't have to have any repercussions for the rest of their lives. So that test is fun and it's fascinating that it predicts anything at all. But in in fact, most of the children who do poorly on the marshmallow test turn out with no worries, simply because it's a test that's full of error. What we've done in our longitudinal studies sort of contrasts with that a bit, and that is, again, we have used all of the data sources that we have, the mothers, the teachers, the research workers, even the children themselves, interviewed these people over and over and over every year about the child's self-control style. So when when I talk about a child who has good self-control or poor self-control, that means that it was that style was sustained over the first decade of life and that everyone agreed that that was the child's style, the mothers, the teachers, the research workers, and so forth. With that type of measurement of self-control, we do get continuities right up into their late 40s in the Dunedin study. So, what we're finding now is that the children who had the best self-control when they were three-year-olds and five-year-olds now have the most assets. They have the most highly skilled occupations. They have the fewest health problems. They are the least likely to be addicted to anything like tobacco or alcohol or cannabis. They have slower aging. So, we're able to measure their pace of aging by tracking biomarkers over 20 years. And the children who had the best self-control in very early life are actually biologically younger today than their peers. And that's pretty remarkable over five decades of following people. You know, what we should also pay careful attention to here was not just as Timmy's talked about, which is the consequences of early self-control or the lack thereof, but it's determinants. Because one of the things we tend to do when we only look at a child's behavior, and especially when it predicts later on problematic things, is we risk blaming the victim. And one of the things we know is that self-control is one of those domains of development that environmental exposures and developmental experiences make a big difference for. Surely some children come into the world and developing self-control is easier, like the timid child, in contrast to the child who is more rambunctious. But how children are raised, the kind of risks they face, the kind of control they can exert over their life makes a big difference. In fact, if you stop and think about the marshmallow test, and I agree with Timmy's critique of it or appraisal of it, is that if you grow up in a family and in a community where your actions don't have consequences, where what you do doesn't matter for how people subsequently treat you, where you don't develop a sense of control, why would you trust these people who say, if you wait, I'll give you three marshmallows or you can have one right now? In other words, being out of control is often something that's developmentally manufactured, not necessarily something that's inborn. 
Another point you make in the book that I thought was interesting is that, yes, self-control from that first decade, so ages one to 10 matters, but what can have more effect is what that self-control looks like in the second decade of life, 10 to 20, because as you, I think one of you alluded to, that's when addictions could start, that's when crime can start, and that can have more of an impact on your 30s and 40s. Yeah, we did a paper on on what we call just a teenager's mistakes. And look, this is kind of me search because I made a lot of those mistakes when I was that age. So I didn't need a fancy psychological theory to help me generate these hypotheses. But we just looked at the children according to the amount of self-control that they had as toddlers. Uh, and then we looked at uh, the kinds of mistakes that they made when they were teenagers. And the children with very low self-control when they were preschool children ended up being more likely to start smoking, to get a police record, and that would interfere with their being able to to get a job later. They were more likely to have an unplanned pregnancy or to get a girl pregnant, and they were more likely to drop out of high school without qualifications. So these were the kinds of mistakes that a a young person can make. They sort of happen in a moment, but they can really change the whole course of the rest of your life, and they're very difficult to overcome. And those are the kinds of things that sort of led me to think that if you have a child who has, you know, regardless of whether your child has good or poor self-control, but if you have a child who's interested in trying new things and is lively and curious, and you think, think therefore, they're at, at risk of maybe making a mistake as a teenager, the trick is to get them through the adolescence years without any of those four mistakes. You don't want an addiction, you don't want a pregnancy, you don't want a police record, and so forth. And so, I mean, so there's two points of intervention that could happen there. One, you can start doing intervention when they're kids. And you talk about that, like Head Start has been shown to help kids get more self-control because there's like there's stability there, young kids. But then in adolescence, that's a that's a really important time. If you can just do something to help kids avoid, like nudge them away from those you know, police record, alcohol, tobacco they'll probably do okay, even if they had trouble with self-control as a seven-year-old. Yeah, the, the the mistakes made in the teenage years accounted for about half of their adult outcomes. So you might say that if you had a child who was on a poor self-control trajectory in elementary school, if you could get them past adolescence without any of those really bad life-altering mistakes, they would have a second chance as a young adult. And I think people know, you know, anecdotally have known a kid like that. They're just a terror, right? When ages seven through 10. And then so they found You're talking something. talking about me. Right. Or, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Or they, they found a sport that in adolescence or they found something they got really passionate about and they were able to just direct on. They just turned their life around mm -hmm. after that. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I think when, when we're trying to... When behavioral scientists are trying to get our papers published in journals, we very often overemphasize the extent to which we were found continuity from childhood to adulthood. And we're able, you know, isn't it remarkable that we're able to predict, you know, a job failure at age 35 from reading difficulties at age six? That is remarkable, but usually the effect sizes, the statistical effect sizes are quite modest. And so the flip side of that, which we seldom emphasize, is that most of the children who had reading difficulties at age six did not go on to have employment failure at age 35. And this is something that I really like about what Jay did with the book. He honed in on each of those instances of lack of deterministic prediction to point out that more kids turned out right than turned out wrong. And so I think he, he took a, a body of research and really made it be uplifting and encouraging for families. It's in a most terrific way. Let me just add there that um, one reason I could do that was because the re research revealed what I like to call, given what Temi's just been referring to, is lawful discontinuity. That is, when do we get the lack of prediction because we can explain it? When we can explain why something doesn't predict, I almost think we understand it better than we can just predict. So, for example... One of the interesting findings that Temi and Offshore and Richie's work in New Zealand shows, or maybe I'm confusing it with the UK work, is that being bullied, you know, is obviously not surprisingly not good for one's mental health. And in fact, it even is related to obesity. However, 
It turns out that if you have a supportive relationship back at home with your parents or with a sibling, all of a sudden that that anticipated, almost expected negative effect of that bullying is much lessened. So there we have an interesting lawful discontinuity in prediction. A negative exposure does not realize a negative outcome because they're what we in the jargon call protective factors or buffering processes that get in the way. You might think of it as, you know, instead of the light switch turning on the light, somebody's gone and metaphorically cut the wire that connects the two. So turning on the bullying does not get the obesity because somebody's cut the wire in between. Yeah, you can add resilience in the child through some like a supportive family or friendships. Well, I think I would modify that and say the resilience should not necessarily be attributed exclusively to the child. It's the ecology in which the child is growing up. Gotcha. So it was that supportive family that is the resilience factor that enables the child, if you would, to escape the negative effect of the risky condition, in this case, bullying to, for example, obesity or mental health difficulties. Well, speaking on this idea of bullying, I was wondering, I, I didn't think I read this in the book, but did were you able to f- suss out like who, like not only who was more likely to get bullied, but like who would who was more likely to be bullies? Were you able to figure that out with your studies? Yeah, you know, we looked at the who's more likely to be bullied and we thought, okay, it'll be kids who are overweight. And it wasn't. And we thought maybe it's kids with red hair. No, it wasn't that. We thought it might be kids who are wearing glasses. That was not it. The best vulnerability factor that we could find is there were children who were already withdrawn and timid and fearful. And, you know, I think a bully can smell that. So they go for those type of children and they, they see, they sense vulnerability and then, you know, exacerbate it with their bullying behavior. So if there's a vulnerability factor, that tended to be it is that the child was already a little bit depressed and anxious before the bullying even happened. I think th- this is really consistent with what other bullying workers showed. You know, bullies really are rarely real, true, honest, tough guys. They pick on weak links who won't fight back. And as soon as somebody fights back, it's often the case the bully takes off, skedaddles, has to go find a weak link because the bully is sort of trying to gain status and power. And it's really pseudo status and power often. And that's why they pick on weak links, just like Temi has indicated. What about the likelihood of someone being a bully? Did you just see anything there? Yeah, that comes back to what I was just talking about about 15 minutes ago, but those children who started out being very aggressive and their very first social behaviors, you know, kids who were biting and kicking and not sharing their toys and stealing other children's toys when they were two, and then, you know, they move along and then they become, they just get in the habit of using aggression to get their way and to solve any kind of social problem. And it's it's that bullying is sort of part of that picture. So when we think of the the symptoms of conduct disorder, they include lying and cheating and stealing and running away from home and breaking rules, but they also include being cruel to others and exploiting the weakness of others. So bullying, I think, is part of the overall picture of a child who has uh, conduct problems. Well, and going back to this idea, I mean, of troubled kids, people who, kids who are having like, aggression problems, oftentimes they're boys. Mm-hmm. And there's been a lot of ink spilled about the problem with boys today. Lots of, you know, either, either they're just like disengaged or not interested or just lazy, or they're hyper aggressive, et cetera, et cetera. And I know a lot of parents, you know, there might be parents of teenagers and they see their kid, teenage boys doing really stupid stuff, maybe even getting involved with, you know, breaking the law. And they're like, man, my kid's going to, this is what's going to happen. But what's interesting, you, your studies found that you know, sometimes you don't like, yeah, it's bad. They got, they had a run in with the law. They're doing this dumb stuff, but they're probably going to be okay as long as that they're acting up just happen in adolescence. Yeah, that's right. We we found that if, you know, if a child is going to have a a poor adulthood with an antisocial lifestyle, 
it's almost always that started before they started school. So then there's another kind of a kid who gets involved with a little bit of delinquency and some testing the limits and, you know, uh, drinking too much with peers and maybe having, you know, a car crash or something like that. That kind of thing is more like normative, normal adolescence. Kids who get involved with that kind of thing, it's a good way to break the apron strings. It's a good way to prove to the other kids that you're not a mama's boy anymore. You know, go out with some friends and get into a little bit of trouble. But it because they had good performance at school, decent grades, and warm relationships with their families beforehand, before they they hit that crazy period of adolescence, they tend to be able to pull out of that again. They've got what it takes to have good, warm relationships when they become an adult. They've got what it takes to achieve in life and go on and and finish their educations and and succeed in the labor market. But there's a a sort of just a, a period during adolescence where kids just will act out. And I don't think we should make too much of it. A lot of my research has been um, following kids through this adolescent period and pointing out that the vast majority of kids who break the law are not destined to be lifetime criminal offenders. They're just having a little too much fun. And therefore, that suggests that policing and juvenile justice system policies should take this into account. So, you know, our our juvenile justice system was set up on the notion that you should just identify on the basis of the current crime and choose the punishment to fit the crime. But in fact, if you look developmentally back at the history of the child, you can differentiate between a child who has been doing everything wrong from the outset versus a child who has just recently kind of gone off the rails and made a bad mistake. And so now more and more justice systems have these policies in place and are are working really hard in the courts and in the community policing as well uh, to differentiate, differentiate between these two kinds of kids and really divert those kids who have a good future ahead of them away from criminal charges, away from a criminal record, away from the courts, and certainly away from prison. So, I think it's a real step forward in how we do juvenile justice. Well, one of the longitudinal studies you were all taking part in or looked at here was daycare, kids in daycare, and like the effect daycare had on them later on in life. I know a lot of parents, when they start, when they have kids and they got to go back to work, that's something that they start, they kind of fret about, wring their hands, like, oh, what's going to happen if we put our kid in daycare? Is it going to like affect them? What does the research say? Well, I think in order to understand the research, we have to put it once again in context or at least development in context. We live in a society here in America, in contrast, let's say, to a place like Norway, where I've also done some daycare research, where we don't really have a child care system. It's up to every parent to figure out this problem for themselves. While we have paid parental leave for somewhat in California, we don't have it in other places. And so that's the first thing to consider. The second thing to consider is over the last 30, 40 years, a major change has taken place in how non-poor Americans raise their children. And that is that if a child is going to be in a non-parental care arrangement, be it family daycare or daycare center or even a nanny, when they're four years of age, it's because they started in the first year of life, in the first six months of life. So we end up with a population of children who are getting some kind of non-familial care from the time they're three, four, five, six months of age until they start school. That is quite a different experience than certainly when I grew up or even the immediate generation thereafter. What we found in the when we started the large-scale American daycare study, the mantra among daycare advocates and progressives for the most part was that it's quality stupid. That is to say, as long as the quality of care was good, everything was fine and dandy. And by quality, we meant that the caregivers were attentive, responsive, stimulating, affectionate, the kind of care you'd want for your children. Well, it turned out that story, it turned out the story was not that simple. And in fact, it turned out that the quality of care that a child experienced over the first four and a half years of life informed the child's cognitive and language development. And better quality care was somewhat modestly related to better cognitive and language development. At the same time, what we discovered was 
that the more time you spent in care, hours, days, weeks, months, from birth through four and a half years of life, you were somewhat more likely to be aggressive and disobedient. By the time you started school, in childhood, and in adolescence, you were also more likely to be impulsive and a risk taker. Now, again, these child care effects were small in magnitude per the individual child. But we have to think about is all the children we're talking about. So as I like to pose it or dislike to pose it is what's more important, a bigger effect that affects few or a small effect that affects many. And one of the things some other work has discovered is the more kids in a kindergarten classroom who've had lots of child care, the more all the kids are somewhat aggressive and disobedient. Now, having said that, let me qualify it in one important way. Families turned out to be more important than child care. And invariably, that's because it's not only how people, how, how marriages get along, how people parent, what sibling relations are like, how organized the household is, but also what the genetics parents pass on to their children. So all this is not to say that child care doesn't matter. It does, but it's to keep it again in the context of a broader ecology. What is the society's policies about child care? What kind of family foundations is that child growing up in? And intriguingly, when we go to Norway, where children don't have any child care other than family care for their first year of life, and thereafter, almost all of them go into high-quality center-based care where caregivers receive a, a decent wage and have training, we don't see these negative outcomes of child care any place like we see in America. So we don't want to come to the conclusion that daycare and the separation of children from parents inevitably leads to something. Rather, we need to appreciate that in the current context and the continuing context that we have here in America, That's a, then it's a different story. And here we see both good news, good quality care is good for children's cognitive and language development, and bad news, lots of time in care, which has become normative seems to undermine, broadly speaking, self-control to some extent. Okay, so let's summarize things here a little bit. The reason there's a negative effect in the form of increased aggressiveness, disobedience, when you look at childcare in the U.S., is that American parents are more likely to put their babies into daycare or childcare right after they're born. Whereas in Norway, you don't see that problem because there, the parents get a year of parental leave, so the kids aren't going into daycare for at least a year. They can put it off some. So it seems like starting later, spending less overall time in daycare mitigates possible negative effects to daycare. But another takeaway from your research, too, was that if you have to put your kid into daycare, having a supportive family life can also mitigate possible negative effects, too. So, yes, if, if you can secure good quality care, or even if it's not the best quality care, and you're going to get a lot of support for the children at home, I wouldn't say don't do it. But I think what we have to come back and think about this from a collective society level. And that even if these children are only becoming a little bit more aggressive and disobedient, what happens when you're a teacher with 20 kids in a classroom, and instead of having two or three of them a little more aggressive and disobedient, you have six or seven of them. And in fact, what the evidence is beginning to show is that even affects the kids who've had little daycare. It's almost like you have a kind of behavioral infection that spreads. I don't want to be catastrophic or hyperbolic about this, but I want to get us thinking about not just effects at the individual, on the individual, but effects on many individuals. And then when we put all these individuals together in classrooms and schools and neighborhoods and the like. In in your research, did you also looked at genetics a bit? How did genetics influence these outcomes in these longitudinal studies? We some of the work that we did was actually quite celebrated at the time. This was around the year 2000, 2002, 2003. We published papers that identified a, a specific gene. So one of those was the MAOA gene, which was thought to be in mice a risk factor for uh, aggression, and the serotonin transporter gene, which was thought in humans to be a risk factor for depression. So we looked at those two, and what we found is that those genes didn't have much of any association with the study members' outcomes 
unless the study members were experiencing an adverse home environment or life environment. So the children who had the MAOA gene that was supposed to be at risk for aggression, unless they were exposed to a lot of maltreatment and harsh physical discipline, it wasn't really related to their behavior. It seemed that more like these genes worked in terms of being determining sensitivity to the environment. Now, I have to put out a cautionary note there is that in the, at that time, between 1996 and 2003, when we were doing that work, one could only study one gene at the time. That was all the technology allowed. And then soon after there, the, that the genome-wide association study methods became available and affordable to scientists. And so, the field has moved right away from studying one gene at the time. And, and if you think about it, that was always a kind of a weak approach, but it was the best that we had. It's implausible that one gene could control very much of human behavior, but that was all we could do at that time. And we wanted to get into the, uh, you know, measured, the business of studying measured genes. So we got our feet wet. But those findings were very interesting from the point of view that they attracted a lot of public attention then and were uh, celebrated in the media. They were published in the journal science, which is a very prestigious and discerning journal, and that helped the news spread around that genes were simply not deterministic because up until that point, everybody had been assuming if you found a gene that was associated, it was the cause, like the gene for homosexuality or the gene for bipolar disorder or you know the gene for violence, the warrior gene, that kind of thing. And what our research was showing was that the genes were actually you know, pretty weak and how they worked depended upon the environmental setting that the child was growing up in. So, I think that's the lesson that we take away from from those studies at that time. So, yeah, genes play a role, but the environment also plays a role. Let me just add that this is exactly the theme we've been expressing throughout this, that knowing about the child's behavior or the child other child characteristics, in this case, genetics, the meaning and the importance or the influence of those, of those char- personal characteristics are going, to, are going to depend upon the context in which, that's, in which that child grows up. The gene for X, Y, and Z will not yield X, Y, and Z, usually, if the environment doesn't sustain the expression of X, Y, and Z. Temi and I have a friend who wrote a great book about the biological determinants of crime, and he's not a criminal. Yet, as he points out in his book, he meets almost, he repeatedly meets criteria for having biological factors that dispose one toward crime. So it becomes a very interesting question. And I think the early study that Temi was referring to began to shed light on this, which is that if we're not taking context into consideration, then we're going to be pretty limited in just looking at characteristics of children, especially if those are measured at one point in time or with a single gene. So what's the future of this research? I mean, are there any questions that are, you're exploring now? Like one thing I thought today was, do you know if there's any studies getting started about how COVID, like all the things that happened in the pandemic, school shutting down, kids having to go home, how that will affect them later on in life? Is there anything like that going on? Yeah, yeah, there's lots. And in fact, when when we get off of this Zoom call, I'm going to be having one with the uh, Canadian Longitudinal Study of all the children growing up in Western Canada, which has done just that. We've been madly collecting data on how the family's experience of COVID has been and how it's affecting uh, the children's adjustment. So, yes, there are others been quite a scramble to collect data on this. And as you may imagine, it's pretty complicated. You got to do it fast. You got to get in there. It's a time when people are stressed and uncomfortable. The last thing they want to be doing is talking to a researcher. So it's been a challenge to collect the data, but we need to have information on how the pandemic has affected family relationships, how the pandemic has affected anxiety levels, 
sleep, appetite, how the pandemic has affected the children's ability to study and keep up at school, whether they've been going to school or staying home, and who in the family has actually tested positive for the virus, who's been sick, and has anyone in the family passed away uh, because of COVID. So there's a lot of data to collect and very little time to do it in. And, and it's also a moving target. So you can't ask the family these questions just once. You need to go back a couple of months or three months later and ask them again because the pandemic is is lasting a long time and people who had no difficulty with it three months ago are now having serious difficulties because of it. And we're starting to see some fascinating findings and there'll be more. But, but I think that we can generate some reasonable hypotheses here based on everything we've said so far which is that even children who you might anticipate are most vulnerable to the isolation, the lack of schooling, et cetera, from the effects of COVID, to the extent that they find themselves in supportive, nurturing families that have the resources, psychological, economic, and otherwise, to compensate for the losses of experience, they're going to do better than other kids who start out with the same vulnerabilities, but don't get that. So it's really when you're carrying, when you're vulnerable yourself for genetic reasons, for temperamental reasons, for behavioral reasons, and then your family is also limited. It's a chaotic household. It's maybe a poor household. It may be a household in which mother and father are not getting along or siblings are not getting along. Now you get a double whammy. And so again, The moral of the story is look at the child's development in the context of who he or she is as a biological and a behavioral organism and in the context of the world that child is living in. In this case, it's going to be often a sheltering in place family. So, Brett, can I can I turn things around and ask you a question? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. How did you pick this book? I just, I came across it. I don't know how I come across it. I just, I'm always on the prowl for books. And I just, I'm very interested in how, I'm just, first off, I'm interested in logical studies. Like I've read the book about the grant study and found that fascinating. And then I'm also, as a parent, I've got two young kids. I'm always, maybe I'm, and I'm always, maybe I'm being too paranoid about or too neurotic? Like, what can I do? <laughs> like, yeah, I'm like, am I screwing my kid up? And whenever I read these books, I, it's kind of comforting because it's like, no, you're probably not. You're, you're, you're doing okay. And that's what I got from this. I'd say that's a, that's a very true message. Was there any particular chapter or finding in the book that, that you liked best or that resonated with you? Well, uh, actually, the, the section about self-control was really good. And we actually, so my family, every week we have like a, a, family, a family meeting night where we start off, like we go talk about what's going on in our schedules, get that synced up. And then we also share like a short like message. And we, I did the message about self-control and I had the kids uh, read the, the William Wordsworth poem. Yeah. Child and like ask, what does that mean? You know, the child is father of the man. And it was really sick. My kids, you know, my son is 10, my daughter Scout, she's seven. And I was really surprised. Like they got it. Like they understood what this romantic poet was getting at. Like what they're what what happens to him as a child, as a kid, can have uh influence as you know, basically they said, yeah, I'm raised like my son said, like, there's I'm raising my my future self. And I'm like, That's Bingo, really kid. gorgeous. Like, you got it. And it was it was fun. Yeah, the fact that you're having family meetings, I too, too answers the question of you know, are you doing anything wrong? No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> so having family meetings is 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 one real clear characteristic of a very functional, very positive family who who raises great kids. I think. Well, I would just modify that a little bit, Demi. If you're not doing something wrong, you're not human. You know, <laughs> you, you don't have to bat a thousand to raise kids well. You just, you know, I I sometimes think that the reason Americans like baseball is because 300 is a really good batting average. (laughs) Um, And the idea you have to get it all right to do well, to win, so to speak, is really one of, you know, it's the perfectionist dilemma. So I would say, I would agree with Temi that a family meeting is a good indication of a well-structured, organized, 
household, but I'm sure you're not doing everything right and don't expect to. Right, no. No, definitely Yeah, not. I remember when we first did the, the paper on self-control and it came out in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and quite a few journalists were uh, contacting me and asking me, well, what do you do to foster self-control in a child? And, and I don't have any children, so what do I know? So, I'm calling up Jay and going, Jay, tell me what to say. And he said, well, something that families could do is instead of just giving a kid their allowance and just, you know, giving them the money, handing them the money, you could have a family meeting and you could try to anticipate all the things that are going to happen during the week that they could spend that money on and have them choose which ones are the most important to them so that, you know, so they won't end up at the end of the week having the most fun and exciting thing, but they're already out of money. So, just just planning how to spend one's allowance with your dad is turns out to be the best training in self-control. And I, I have never forgotten that. No, yeah, we've done that with my kids. We give my kids allowance once a week, but I also started a savings account for them. And I, I said, I give them the money, like it's cash. And like, all right, you can either keep this and you can spend it however you want, or you can put it in your savings account. What would you like to do? And at first they're like, I'm going to spend it. But then they quickly realized, ah, I played with this Lego for two nights and then I'm done with it. So now they've become savers. They're, they're little warm buffets now. Let me make a suggestion to modify that a bit. And, and if you want to is, and I've thought about this as a teenage pregnancy prevention strategy, which is, let's say you give your kid $2, okay? You can say, well, $2, nobody gives their kid $2 anymore. $2 doesn't go anywhere. So you have my age here at 68, but be that as it may, let's say you give your kid $2. You can say, you know, that's yours to spend. But everything you put in up to a dollar in a savings account, I'll match it. So now, and and what you're doing is inducing consideration of the future. And this is where it comes back to the fact that, you know, often kids who grow up without self-control are never given the opportunity to acquire control. Actions don't have consequences. They're not structured to provide, but the family's not structured to provide planning. So why would you, you know, delay gratification as the marshmallow test for something that's promised later on versus something to get right now if promises haven't been kept? If when you followed the rules, you haven't gotten the payoffs. So I think a Warren Buffett, the strategy would be you get $2 up to a dollar, you put it in your savings account, I'll match it. Because now you've got a three dollar allowance, not a two dollar allowance. Yeah, yeah. Start the four hundred one k matching. Early. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Terry Jay, this has been a great conversation. Thanks for your time. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. I've loved it. Thanks so much for inviting us. My guests today were Terry Moffat and Jay Belsky. They are the co-authors of a book called The Origins of You, How Childhood Shapes Later Life. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can also check out our show notes at aom.is slash childhood, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic. 